So if I could invite our next speakers to the podium, um, we will hear a presentation from Sylvia Hahn and Alex Sullivan. Hi everyone, I'm Sylvia. I'm a graduate student of Duke University. I'm currently studying bioengineering. My name is Alex Sullivan. I'm an undergrad electrical engineer at UC San Diego. Our project is inside outside two complementary approaches to vascular mod. Oh, right. It's true. It's flexible. Okay. And our project mentor is Brian E. Chapman. So I'm the inside of this project. Um, vascular characterization via skeleton graph atlases. And the basis of our project was to be able to process CTPA images. Um, for the purpose of being able to identify and characterize vascular structure. Um, this could be important for automating the process of diagnosis for very, various pulmonary diseases as well as image searching. We'll get to that later. Um, we received the images from uh, an image repository that was generated from uh, medical examinations to check for pulmonary emboli and the images were then segmented to isolate the blood vessel walls um, using ITK SNAP uh, image toolkit software. And the beginning of my project starts with the skeleton graphs. Um, and uh, the skeleton graphs are generated from the blood vessel surfaces by an iterative parallel thinning algorithm. Basically what that does is it takes the, uh, the cellular wall of um, the blood vessel and gradually erodes it away layer by layer until it's only a single voxel wide center line. You can see uh, there's some examples right here of uh, some skeleton graphs that were generated using this algorithm. And um, they are generated into a network X file which uh, contains coordinates for nodes and edges. And um, it's a directed ordered graph, so there is a start and an end to uh, these blood vessels. What we're looking at here is um, a pulmonary tract, and this is where the blood uh, flows in at the root node of zero, and it gradually branches into the capillaries at the end. Um, right, also it's uh, convenient to do this because uh, dealing with a blood vessel surface is a lot of data and not all of it is necessarily useful for the processing of vascular structure. And so we introduced this concept of an atlas. It basically takes a set of ordered graphs and uh, generates a population set out of it. And it's useful because if you generate a population, then you can compare an individual to a set of atlases in order to gain certain knowledge about uh, how strongly they belong to that atlas. If you generate an atlas for, say, pulmonary hypertension and then compare a graph to that atlas, you get an idea of how strongly a patient is at risk of pulmonary hypertension. And uh, there's several methods of generating, generating atlases. Uh, various publications have different methods, and it reflects different philosophies about um, how to interpret a population, as well as uh, what sort of data you can massage out of these atlases. My method was a, uh, a scalar assignment method, where we basically took a set of atlases and assigned uh, points to every uh, we assign scalars to every point in a 3D space, and it basically is a probabilistic approach to uh, mapping these atlases. Um, how it begins is, as you saw in the previous slide, there were numbers on those graphs. I uh, take each graph and I number them in terms of their branching depth. So you start at the beginning of the graph where blood flows into the blood vessel, and that would be a rank of node zero. And gradually, as you continue down this branching tree, you get into higher and higher branching depths. And uh, that's important later for the process of comparing nodes of like branching depth. Um, also, there was some pre-processing that had to 
uh, be performed on these uh, graphs individually before we could compile them into an atlas. It was basic stuff like uh, centering the root node around the origin so that they're all um, oriented the same way. If you don't do these pre-processing steps for the atlases, um, you're not really getting all the data out of the vascular structure. They're sort of pointing in all the different directions based on how the person was imaged and what direction they were imaged from. And so it really doesn't represent the true vascular structure of the graphs. There was also a scaling factor dependent on how large your patient was. Um, all the graphs are normalized after they're uh, collected to uh, a standard size since people are of different size. And so I took that scale factor and inverted it to get back real world dimensions. And finally, there's uh, a rotating step again. We'll get back to that. This is my algorithm for uh, generating the atlases. We start with a set of graphs, uh, which uh, you want to compile into an atlas. And again, as I said earlier, we rank them. And uh, each of these uh, super nodes contains the coordinates of all graphs in the data set of uh, like branching depth. From there, you uh, calculate some statistics based on all the different coordinates and the spread of how much space each super node takes up in the atlas. And finally, you take those statistics and um, apply different mapping functions um, in R3 uh, to get your actual atlas, which assigns uh, your probability values to the space. Um, from there, we use membership scores in order to compare an atlas to a uh, population, or to compare a graph to an atlas. I used a Gaussian because it's easy to generate a scalar from simply the mean and variance measures. It's pretty low order mo moments. And um, I used a 3D Gaussian in order to populate the 3D space. Uh, the way I compared graphs to the atlas was by uh, taking all points which an atlas occupied in space and then average them so you get an average probability of, the at of a graph occupying that atlas. And you get a certain membership to that atlas in the process. This is all fine, but um, at the end of the day we had to test if it worked. And so I drew a simple test to see if it could properly identify vascular structure. We had two different types of structural images. Uh, pulmonary and aorta graphs. And we, I uh, generated an atlas for both pulmonary and aorta and then took both pulmonary and aorta graphs and compared them to each atlas independently in order to determine how well we could identify each structure. And currently my program is able to identify the correct structure about 65% of the time. All the, the points in this 3D space represent uh, scalar probabilities of uh, your graph occupying that space, and this is the graph itself. This is a particularly good graph with 85% certainty. It cor correctly identified the structure, and you can see that the scores are pretty different. Likewise, this is an example of um, a poor trial. Uh, again, it identified the incorrect structure, but it was only about half certain. And finally, um, this project has a lot of work as far as um, improving the study. Obviously, it's not perfect at identifying structure. And future applications of this product are to um, auto-diagnosis of pulmonary diseases, giving patients a profile of their cardiovascular risk, as well as uh, medical image searching in a database. We'll hold questions until the end of Sylvia's presentation. Um, I'm doing the outside part. My project is on surface shape characterization of vasculature structures. I'm going to go over a little background on statistical shape modeling and then talk about my project objectives for the summer, tools and methods I used, current findings, and which will lead into the future directions. So currently, statistical shape analysis is widely used by the neuroimaging community. Several projects have been done to shape model like the hippocampus 
and the caudate, which are both very important components in the brain. This method has the potential to locate the differences between healthy and pathological structures, which will lead into the phenotyping of diseases for gene discovery. One of the methods researchers have been using is called SPARM-PDM, which stands for Spherical Harmonic Point Distribution Models. Um, one main reason why people are using it is because it's easy for surface ma manipulation since a sphere domain is continuous, which allows for like flexible and easier computation. One of the main limitations of this method is that in the object that we're trying to model has to have a spherical topology. My project objective is to extend usage of this method for vascular shape modeling and to analyze its ability to distinguish between similar and different vascular shapes for future disease-specific image retrieving. The data I use for my project is MR aneurysm cases and CT pulmonary cases. For the MR aneurysm cases, I actually had to subregion the specific object from MR scans and then clean it up using ITK view and ITK snap. And the main tool I use for my project is called the SPARM PDM toolbox, which was developed by um, UNC. I originally intend to use this toolbox along with Slicer 3, which is a really great visualization program that allows you to see several objects at the same time and compare the statistics like after you compute everything. But then I encounter many problems such as incompatibly is un incompatible issues between the different release versions of the toolbox as well as missing shared libraries. So in the end, I decide to um, just stop using Slicer 3 and just use the command line parsing to compute all my statistics. Throughout this whole troubleshooting process, the UNC de developers were really helpful in answering my questions and helping me getting through this whole toolbox process. And for statistics, I use Shape Mancova and KW Mesh Visu, which were also developed by UNC. Now I'm gonna take you through the pipeline of the toolbox. The first um, process is a post-processing of the segmenta seg segmented images. What it does is it extracts the original image label and relabels it to num number one. So all your objects will have an image label of one to be consistent. Then it resamples the image data to ensure that it's isotropic in the X, Y, and Z direction. And then it fills in the fully enclosed cavities to make sure that the object cementation is fully packed solid. This is the second part where, before, where it generally will generate two meshes. But before that, it, ha it has to make sure that our object is spherical or it has a spherical topology. And by calculating the Euler's number, it can do that. And you can see why it's important later on. Um, from this step, it generates two meshes. One is a triangular surface mesh representation, and one is its spherical parameterization. What this means is that it takes each point on the surface of the object and maps it to a point on the sphere surface so that so you would have like a spherical um, coordinate for each of the point of the object which can be later used to, for easier statistics computation. This is the last part where it computes for the spherical harmonic coefficients, which is pretty much assigning a theta value and a phi value for each of the surface points. And it also fixes the correspondence and alignment. So if you see right here, it tries to align, make sure the north and south pole um, corresponds to the first order ellipsoid, as well as um, align it in the center. And for alignment, it also makes sure that each of your object has the same template size. So like what the Greek god Procrustes would do is he would make everyone that comes by his house to make sure they fit in his iron bed, make sure like 
If you're too tall, you have to shrink, and if you're too small, then you have to lengthen. For statistical analysis, I use Shane Mankova to compute the statistical differences between local service point distributions of two groups, and later on use KW mesh visu to look at the distance, vector, and p-value significance maps. So for my current findings is, before I mention how it's very important to use um, or to model an object that has a sp spherical topology. Well, apparently, the first case that I worked with was, was a pulmonary trunk, and it actually passed the Euler number test, which was surprising. But if you look at it later on, the, sp um, the spherical, spherical parameterization actually didn't come out too well, like half of the sphere is like missing. That's why later on, when you look at the SPARM representation, it looks nothing like the pulmonary trunk here. And later on, I uh, worked with aneurysm cases. And you can see right here, it has a really nice spherical par parameterization. And later on, the SPARM representation actually looks closer to the aneurysm itself. And later on, I worked with um, comparing aneurysm cases of the same patient on the left side and aneurysm cases from two different patients on the right side. And here, if you look at the color bar, you can actually see that when you compare um, two, separate case, two, se two separate patient cases, it has a larger distant range. And you can actually visualize it much better looking at the vector graph because there's a lot, um, the magnitude is much larger, and the directions, there's a lot more variations in the vector directions. So this toolbox can somewhat show that. So show that um, the, how it distinguished between different structures and similar structures. So what I intend to work on in the future is um, work on a larger and better process data set for, in order to assure this method. Like a lot of the aneurysm cases that I worked with, like few of the cases didn't actually go through the SPARM um, pipeline because the Euler number was not zero. So I probably had to clean up the images a lot better and probably work with a lot more cases to make sure that this method actually works to distinguish between similar and different structures. And then uh, apply this method to coronary CT images for Kawasaki diseases when the cases are actually available for me to use. So I want to give my thanks to um, my mentor, Dr. Chapman, Dr. Parker for the usage of his MR images, UNC for developing most of the tools that I use for this project, and NIH for funding my internship. One of the things that I took away most was learning how to use Linux operating system, and I'm actually really glad that I learned it because it was very helpful in the whole process of working on my project. Thank you, uh, Brian and NIH. <laughs>
take into account of like the north and south pole of the object <clears throat> and align it to like a first order ellipsoid and oh, it also centers it according to the first order ellipsoid. And then the second part is using the procrustes alignment so each of your object is actually the same shape. Oh, yeah. But yeah. since I'm feeding this all into the toolbox, I actually don't know like how well it aligns or how well it um, actually like corresponds, fix the correspondence. Okay, thank you.